Raphael, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Great to have you on. People here at EF are very excited about what you're doing. So to kick us off, just give me a brief 30 second intro into what you're doing at Open Cosmos. Sure. So at, at Open Cosmos, we provide simple and affordable space missions. This means that we manufacture the satellites, we procure them launch, we deal with all the bureaucracy aspects, and we even operate them in orbit. So people can have access directly to the data that they provide. This can be used for telecommunication purposes, for remote sensing, gathering images that can have a very, very big impact in agriculture, meteorology, any actually any industry that you can think about could use this data to solve problems in a way that is measured. And this is what excites us most about what we do, that we can measure things and give insights globally to solve the biggest problems. I want to talk a little bit more in a bit about how the world will look different uh, when you succeeded in your mission. But just to give us a little bit of context into, um, into the space field and the technologies around that, why hasn't there been more progress in the last few decades in this domain? Hmm. I think, I think this, this industry has, has always been like very, very conservative, very risk adverse and um, has been also been very protective about its technology. Definitely, if you compare it to other industries like the computer industry, this has been exactly the case. And when you think about it, they started more or less at the same time during the 60s. The first big computers like occupied a full room and they were only used by, by research institutions or big, big organizations that could afford them. And uh, that's exactly what was happening in the space industry. Big satellites being used just by NASA or a few other organizations. Then in computers, it changed. Uh, people at Silicon Valley decided to make those computers smaller and affordable. People started using them. And now the next thing is like we have the internet, Google, and all the applications that we use daily. Uh, that, that didn't happen uh, in the space industry. When, when you think about it, uh, the access to that technology has been prohibitively expensive. Um, and also it requires like a, a lot of expertise to reach that level. So what we are doing at Open Cosmos is we are trying to miniaturize it, like make it a lot smaller and uh, uh, a lot faster to be deployed. So we can empower the applications to happen next, uh, using this technology as a tool. Uh, it doesn't have to be a romantic uh, ideal or something really fancy, it's just another tool that should be democratized. For sure, and how will the world look different once you guys have made the progress that you want to make in say five or 10 years time? What do you hope to see? Hmm. So I imagine that you can um, measure any problem globally that you would face, say the production of, of food, say uh, efficiency in transportation, say the energy problem or any environmental problem, any risk, any hazard that you could figure out uh, globally. And you can measure everything regarding that and make educated assessments, educated uh, decisions based on, on that global data. This is one of the things we can do. Uh, and it's empowered by, by the technology that we provide. Of course, there will be many other uh, companies and many other applications emerging from this enabling one, but having access to this technology is key to, to, to empower those, those companies. Another thing that we can do is, is help provide better global communication. Um, it's, it's not a surprise to think that now that machines are talking within each other, having like access globally to that sort of communications can be easily achieved uh, through, through satellites in orbit, actually deploying infrastructure much quicker and much effectively than it would be done on the ground. So actually a few of the customers that we have are working in those areas. Love to talk to you about some of those projects as well in a bit, but before we go into that, what was the process for you to make the jump to become a space entrepreneur? So I believe you studied engineering at university, you're working for Airbus. What made you decide one day, I want to start my company? Yeah. So funny enough, I kind of, uh, I don't remember exactly the day when I decided to start the company, but I do remember when the idea of actually bringing access to space uh, to, to, to everyone came to my mind and that was, I was still back at university, I was 20 year old and uh, I, I started a project alongside with some of my colleagues at university that took pictures from an helium balloon, uh, from very high, high resolution pictures and I was, I was surprised to see that in those pictures you could already see the curvature of earth, in plain day you, you saw the dark sky uh, and 
I realized that space technology was within my reach a little bit. I said, wow, if I've done this with 100 euros, uh, why can't we try to achieve similar things? Of course, the challenge was massive. That they were like the daydreaming the dreams of, of, of a student of aerospace engineering. But yeah, it became my obsession a little bit. So I started working and working and studying hard to, to, to achieve that. Uh, even when I was at university, I was working for a space startup that was working within space tourism. And I was also like trying to, to find new ways of space propulsion to launch things into orbit. Then I was recruited by Airbus Defense and Space and I saw the other side, not the startup space side, but also like the big corporative side and how things worked. Uh, they granted me an MBA, which I'm really grateful for because it allowed me to, to learn a little bit also about all the business side. And literally, I, I never felt prepared to start something like Open Cosmos. I don't think you really do, actually. So at that point, I don't remember exactly the day, but I just said, OK, if I have to start it, I have to put myself under the biggest pressure. And uh, that is leaving completely Airbus, um, putting down like a business model, uh, some, some definitions about the technology that we would be developing, and, and a clear road to market. And uh, yeah, when, when, I, when I got that self, myself into that sort of pressure, I was able to react accordingly. So uh, yeah, thanks to that, I think I, we, we, we now have something like Open Cosmos. You're a special case for a lot of the founders at EF because you're essentially a sole founder, but you do have a close team of uh, around you that has been working with you from, I believe, very, very early days. Tell me a little bit about how you met these people and how did you realize they were the right people to help you enact your vision and build the company? Yes, absolutely. And actually, I must say that everyone in the, th in, in the team, particularly in those early days, feels like a founder to me as well. Like, it would have been impossible without Han and his expertise in electronics or without Alej and his management skills and, and capabilities also in all the technical details to actually get Open Cosmos started. How did that happen? Well, it happened here at, at EF. One of the things that you need most when you try to do a like, space company is talent, engineering talent, and capabilities to deliver projects, particularly if you want to deliver a satellite in six months like, you, like we did, deliver projects extremely fast. And uh, EF allowed me to, to have access to that sort of people, to be in an environment that truly catalyzed our development. It's true, we do hardware, we do software, and we do service. So we have a quite complex offering to our customers and being surrounded by companies that, within a glimpse, uh, develop machine learning algorithms and can iterate them very quickly and find a path to, to, to market was like a big challenge for us. I, I didn't want to be this low hardware company, you know, I really wanted to, to keep up the pace and make it as quick as I could in order to, you know, be as close as those companies as possible. And that, that, that really, really synced in our DNA. And that's one of the key reasons why Open Cosmos does uh, its satellites and its missions in a tenth of the time that the normal industry actually does. So talk to me about the first one of those missions. How did it come about and how were you able to do that basically without having had any prior experience in a tenth of the time that it would usually happen? Well, actually, we had quite a lot of, of the experience in order to, to in the technology and all the aspects. So please don't think that this was an act of, of magic. The team was really, really skilled and are really prepared towards achieving that. But First times are always unique, and this one particularly was crazy uh, because uh, what what happened was when I was alone still like pitching to people with with a PowerPoint, it came to me an opportunity to 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 get hold of a launch opportunity and to develop a, a mission uh, for that. So I took it, um, and uh, I very quickly had to find like the team in order to cut the light. So imagine yourself twenty seats. Um, with a, a launch opportunity to be able to deliver your first technology full satellite to orbit and having to put together that team, right? So this is, this is exactly the timing when I landed at EF. Uh, and I had the challenge actually to do it in eight months um, because the launch would be gone by then. <laughs> so it was either we literally applied all the concepts on the process, all the technologies and the skills that we had in order to, to achieve that or we would fail. Um, and everyone, I can admit it now, even myself, I was thinking that this was not achievable in those days. Uh, 
I saw it as a catalyzer for our developments, as a, a big challenge that we had to take into in order to, to be successful as a company. And that wherever we landed in that delivery uh, process, we, we would be, it would be good for the company in a sense, right? Uh, so, so what happened was that we hit every single milestone after that, including the delivery of the satellite, uh, going through like assembling a satellite in the north, near the North Pole in Kiruna during, uh, during Christmas time, because there were the only facilities that were available for us in order to be able to do it in, in a clean room. Um, yeah, doing the, the checks towards the program just two weeks before the delivery and everything actually magically working as it should, uh, putting together all the ground infrastructure in order to be able to operate the satellite because one of our partners just a few weeks before that happened actually told us that uh, they weren't ready. So we had to build all the, all the software to modulate and demodulate the communication with those satellites. And it was like a miracle, but we were able to deliver that first satellite uh, in six months. It's still currently in orbit, fully operational, and we are really, really proud. We were five people. So that's how it started. And since then, every single time that someone asked us, okay, how, how do you even dare to claim that you can deliver a satellite in a year? Said, because we delivered the first in sets. Uh, how do you dare to say that you can do that with, with the team of, I mean, we are 20 now, but imagine 10 or 15. Well, because we, we did the first one in five. Uh, so from there, fact proven, uh, it, it's easier to demonstrate that you don't only have a vision, but that you actually have a business. For sure. And in terms of adding to the team, so you said you started off with five, you're now 20. What have you learned about the hiring process? How are you going about picking the people to join the team? Because I assume they usually have to have probably quite a very specific skill set that fits into what you're trying to do. Yeah. What are you looking for? How do you filter that process? And how has it changed over time as well? Hmm. Hmm. So I don't think there is like a recipe towards hiring. Everyone does its own way. We have, I believe, a quite unique way to do it at Open Cosmos. And it's we don't look too deeply into CVs or curriculums. Uh, we do look a lot into how quickly people learn about something. So the first thing that we do is to engage in a challenge project where the candidate completely defines what they want to be doing. And we just say, assess exactly that, how quickly they learn, how they interact with the team and how, how their mind works and how complementary is to the way that we work. Uh, of course, if, if that person also has experience and a skill set within the area and the domain, that's extremely valuable. But otherwise, we prefer smart, fast learners than actually uh, just experienced people because it's a startup needs to be very adaptive, needs to be very reactive, and you would rather be close to the people who can who can change quickly. So that's one thing that I think that we do differently. Now, the problem that we have with that is that it's not very scalable because we need to dedicate quite a lot of, of time. So um, we, we, we filter quite a lot in the beginning, and I'm sure that there is where there, there is the most room for improvement in our case, right? Uh, I, I believe that now at the stage where we are, where we are 20, the recruitment burden is already so high on us that we need to leverage it with someone that is specialized in that early process and also like in, in all the onboarding process to bring all the structure. And it's one of, one of the things that I'm focusing most right now. Uh, we need to double the size of our team once again. So by the end of the year, we need to be 14 in order to deliver all the satellites that we have in mind. And I can't handle all the hiring on myself or even if the team was to help, I don't want to distract them uh, that deeply. So yeah, bringing that structure, that process into hiring right now is one of my priorities. And in terms of projects that you've got coming up this year and, and next year in the near future, what are you most excited about at the moment? Yeah, so there was a quite unique project that uh, we signed last year and we are actually now manufacturing for the European Space Agency. When you have an organization like the European Space Agency, the best in Europe actually asking you to help like deliver an entire mission uh, demonstrating a cutting edge uh, telecommunication technology to us it was like a very very big milestone uh, this is like true commercial proven and uh, um, now I'm really excited to be working uh, or to have all the team working in that project because uh, 
it not only validates our approach to business and our uh, processes and our technology itself, but also it shows that that even to the biggest organization, the, the biggest expertise in the space industry, our uh, offering is complementary and helpful. And that means a lot. Next is to jump into all other industries, of course. This is the purpose of this technology is not to remain only available to space experts, it's to become available to absolutely everyone. But that's a very exciting project for us. And talk to me a little bit more about some of these more general applications. Like, What are you most excited about in terms of what yeah. this technology can be applied to? Because like you said, in the long run, it could be potentially applied to almost anything or many industries. So. Yeah, this is one of the bits that I love most about my work, that every single day we have people coming to us with new sensors, with new technology that we like to gather new data sets. And uh, our goal at Open Cosmos is to help them uh, that happen. And when, when someone comes to you and, and, and asks, okay, how I can monitor the spread of a disease in soybeans over whole Asia in order to predict better how I can prevent that from happening and that will increase the production of, of that particular uh, good uh, globally. That's really exciting because it taps into a lot of other problems like food availability uh, or, 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 or yeah, the, the, the production of literally any commodity. So we, we are seeing a lot of things happening within agriculture, uh, a lot of things happening in into telecommunications, a lot of things happening into um, applications of images that allow you to have intelligence on efficiency of transportation, of energy consumption. Uh, will everyone, every single company be able to deliver all of those? It's, it's, it's not what we are here for. We are here to enable them bringing the technologies that, that enables those solutions to be, to be finally delivered. But in our case, uh, uh, we see our role there like truly enabling this technology to be put up there and to, to, to be gathering all, all, all those data sets that all the, without them, the solutions cannot be found, right? So um, yeah, th these are some of the applications that I think are most useful. And in terms of cost and speed of production, how much more progress do you see down the line in the future? Do you think you're really just at the start of the curve and it's going to get, has the potential to get an awful lot better? How do you see that developing? So the, there is, a, when you look at, at operational and operational excellence, there is always room for improvement. Um, we've, we've already gone through a big jump and this is because we changed the way the process worked. If you think on how satellites are traditionally developed, uh, people come first with the sensor and they shape the entire satellite around them and they dimension the power systems, the onboard computers, everything in order to match the needs of that payload, that sensor that will deliver the data in the end. We have followed like more of a standardized approach. We have like a, a, a modular satellite that we have manufactured microchip up and designed microchip up. And it, it allows a flexibility to adapt the, the, the sensor, the technology to it. What this allows us is not to be handcrafting satellites for each one of our customers, but to be adapting that same satellite to many other applications. And when you do that, you can tap into economies of scale, mass customization, and so on and so forward. So do I believe we can do better? Yes. Uh, we will be trying to make it shorter, cheaper, more affordable, faster to market. Anything that helps people develop applications out of this, it's, it's our vision, it's our goal. Um, have we already gone through a big uh, jump within that? Yes, we are also already have. Where did the inspiration for applying mass customization to this industry come from? Was it something that you've been thinking about for a long time? Was it the result of a conversation? How, how did it kind of arise? It was actually a, a, a result of a conversation within one of these rooms, actually. Uh, I, was, I was talking with, with Wendy, who, who helped us all through the way when we were at EF and now is continuing to, to help us build Open Cosmos Healthy. And we were, we were trying to find an analogy of what we were doing. And um, I, always, I always thought about it as, as um, customizing the satellite, but at scale uh, as possible. And, and uh, yeah, 
economies of scale are very linked to, to mass production. So yeah, that moment she mentioned uh, the perfect link of the world where like mass customization and this is something that has been done already for, for the automotive industry and some of this. It makes a lot of sense uh, to, to adopt that term, even if the volumes are significantly lower than the ones that you would see in other in, a, in other industries because we are producing 30 or we aim to produce 30 to 50 satellites a year uh, when, when once we have our uh, facilities at full production it's it's an orders of magnitude less still the approach uh, matches the the description if we cycle back to your childhood do you remember being interested in space in you know that aspect from a very young age was it something you were interested in or did the interest kind of develop later so <laughs> like it, it would be wonderful if I could say that it did, <laughs> but I was actually actually interested in absolutely everything. Okay. I I I love learning about anything, and um, I can say that one of the reasons why I, I I went into aerospace engineering and to space engineering thereafter as a specialization is because I I saw a big challenge, and one thing that I it wouldn't be easy for me to learn uh, on my own, and. Um, yeah, the, the more the more I've been thinking about this actually, and it, it's funny that you mentioned because I've I've come across this this question a few times, and the more I think about it, I think that what what drive me was not necessarily romanticizing about space or how cool it is. It was more, yeah, the challenge or actually achieving that thing that seems impossible and and and, and trying to succeed at it and engaging people who are really good around you in order to be able to achieve it. I I resonate a lot with with one of the sentences from, from the, the, the famous speak that Kennedy uh, said when, when they were planning to go to the moon. They said, before this decade is over, uh, we will put a man on the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Um, yeah, personally, I resonate a lot with, with that sort of spirit. So do you feel that that hunger to learn that kind of innate curiosity that you've explored through all these different threads and then obviously ended up focusing on this domain now do you feel that's one of your biggest assets that's helped you get to where you are now with open cosmos it's it's the biggest asset that everyone in the company shares actually um people joins us because of the challenge people also joins us because we are delivering towards the challenge and because we don't we don't say what we will be doing, but actually what, what we have already done. And this is something that we have like very interiorized with, within us. And uh, definitely one of the key things of the whole Open Cosmos team is that we are challenge driven people and we don't give up and we love what we do and we push and we try it again and we do everything that is, is, is needed to deliver what, what the customer or what we believe society needs. And to finish up, you know, we've spoken a lot about serving your customers and the experience of building the company and hiring as well. But what have you most learned about yourself during the process of building Open Cosmos? One of the key things I've, I've, I've learned actually through this process is that um, when you have big challenges, actually, and we were talking about challenges now, um, you also have to be prepared, uh, always be prepared to fail. And... Uh, I, I never considered failure as part of, 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 of the process uh, because whenever you start, you, you are not aware of the probability. I mean, we are biased towards not looking at failure. So one, one of the things that I value most of what I've learned is being able like, like to, to look into failure and being aware that everything can, can fail at any moment, but still like having the, 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 the push and the will to, to avoid that happening. And, yeah, I, th I think that that relationship uh, with failure and seeing it as, as something we build on in order to to be able to to be a better company, to be able to to to, to be better people. It's 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 key. I think that's a great note to end on. Raphael, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. <laughs>